right. Well, before uh, we get started with the word tonight, um, uh, we have a testimony. So I'd, I'd like to invite Luis Rodriguez to come up and share a testimony with us. Come on up, Luis. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. Glory. Glory to the Lord. So we're going to hear what God is doing in Lewis's life. Amazing things. How's everyone doing? I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, the last four to five months has been really uh, difficult. Um, you know, in a nutshell, um, I pretty much thought my marriage was over, you know. Um, ended up actually moving out. Um, I was angry, frustrated, hurt. Um, heart was hardened. Um, I was pretty much done, pretty much done. Um, but, you know, I, I'll, I'll say this for, if it wasn't for some of you guys that prayed for us, um, held me accountable. Um, Pastor Adam, you know, if Pastor Adam invites you to Panera Bread, you're in trouble. <laughs> you know, JC, you know, on top of me all the time. Um, you know, Melissa doesn't know this, but uh, I heard her testimony um, on the 19th of April is a Wednesday service. And, you know, the first thing that came to my mind um, when I saw her up here, you know, she's adorable, you know, little thing. You know, waddling on the stage. Um, but when she began to speak, you know, uh, she became 10 feet tall. You know, and one thing that she mentioned was um, restoration, restore. And I must have watched that video 50 times. You know, um, me in the apartment, uh, three, four o'clock in the morning, watching that video. Um, fast forward a few weeks after that, um, we were here at church together. And he doesn't know this, but my brother right here in the green shirt, um, he comes up to me and, you know, he welcomes me to this church, you know? And I'm like, you know, he tells me, make yourself at home. I'm like, you make yourself at home. <laughs> you know, this is my church. Um, but it, it wasn't his fault, you know, because of everything that was happening to me, I allowed myself to be removed from this church. You know, I, I allowed the enemy to stick a finger in my face and tell me I was nothing, you know. And then the next week, Pastor Adam talks about um, finding your identity. So what I would like to do tonight is, in front of the church, is uh, reestablish that identity. First off, um, I'm a child of God. Um, second, uh, he's given me the honor and the privilege um, to be married to the most beautiful woman I've ever met. Um, second, um, you know, because of my past, and I won't get into that, he's given me a heart to serve and protect. So if it's okay with JC and Pastor Adam, I'd like to be put back on the safety team. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, he's also given me a task to be his hands and feet. 
um, has given me a love for outreach and missions. So I know Dina Collins is not here, um, but if she's watching, um, I'd like to be a part of the mission trip to Costa Rica as well. So again, you know, thanks for your prayers. Um, keep praying for us. And you know, I lo we love you guys. Well, we can all go home now. Our God is a good God. Let's just give him a praise in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Lord. You are so good. We praise you. We give you glory in this place, God. We thank you so much, God, that not one of us has gone far from you, Lord Jesus. You draw us all close to you, God. Lord Jesus, you forgive us. You, you, you call us and draw us to you, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you so much for what your son has done, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We give you glory in this place. We give you thanksgiving. We give you honor. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for drawing Lewis back. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's a good God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, go give him a hug. Go give him a hug. Wow. Wow. You know, y'all need to pat yourselves on the back out there. Everybody that's out there, just start patting yourself on the back. Pat, that, pat the person next to you on the back because somebody was praying in this place. Somebody was praying. Goodness, what happens when a church prays and asks God to bring them back, to bring them home? Oh, my God. Hallelujah. 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 I mean, there's no words. Um, there's just no words. There's no words. But you know, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Oh, God answers prayer. He answers prayer. And we went into prayer. We went into fasting. We went into seeking God for Lewis. People went out and, and talked to him and, and encouraged him. And, you know, I mean, God is so good. And listen, Nobody in this fellowship is too far from the next person to go and to speak life and to go and to encourage. And that's what happens when the body gets together and seeks the Lord and begins to pray and fast and say, God, bring them back and intercede for breakthrough. And, and we, I mean, you know, I want to say that what happened with Lewis is a strange occurrence, but it's not. How many times do we have people give testimonies up here of them straying and going away and God brings them back? That should be a hope and a future for everyone out there. And any of your lost family members and friends, God does it. But it takes all of us to pray and to seek and to ask God to come and do this thing because we love our brothers and our sisters. So just remember this, God answers prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow, there is much rejoicing tonight, much rejoicing. So in line with that, with that beautiful testimony, I want to talk tonight about obedience with sacrifice. You often hear that obedience is better than sacrifice. We know that from 1 Samuel 15, verses 22, when Samuel came to Saul and he was disciplining him because Saul had decided to sacrifice some things. And, uh, and Samuel was telling him, listen, what God really wanted was your obedience and not your sacrifice. In other words, what God didn't want to see happen, uh, Saul, was that you were going to go do things your way and call it an offering. Instead, God wanted you, Saul, to do things God's way, and then it would have been obedience. But tonight I want to talk about not just obedience, but that many times obedience has with it sacrifice. 
So obedience with sacrifice is what God calls for when he's getting ready to make a change. Now, let me just tell you about the times and the seasons, because if you know the times and the seasons of God, then you know what he's getting ready to do. And since this is an apostolic and prophetic ministry, we keep up with our ear to heaven. God, what are you doing today? That's why things are always changing rapidly around here and things are always moving is because we're keeping up with God and the pace of God. Well, in 10 days, we're going to be celebrating Pentecost. It's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. But to the Jews, it's called Shavuot. And so that's going to be coming up actually next Wednesday and into Sunday, all right? And so when God began to speak this word to me, he then, of course, reminded me of the times and the seasons, And he began to share with me about the fact that this right now here in the month of May has been a difficult time for a lot of people. Has it been difficult for you out there here in the month of May? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just a few of you, maybe just a few of you. I don't know about how many of you, but a few of you. And God says, listen, I want you to hold on until June. How long is June from now? Only seven days. Hallelujah. Can I get a praise for June? Can I get a praise that June is upon us? And when June comes upon us, that's actually right around Shavuot, because Shavuot is around May 31st to June 1st, right in there. And then, of course, we pop Pentecost on that Sunday, because when we count Pentecost on the Christian calendar, it's always a seven weeks from the la- from the Sunday of Resurrection Sunday, okay? But but the Jewish calendar is different because they're lunar, all right? So it's coming on Wednesday the 31st, but then we'll also be celebrating wins- next Wednesday and, of course, next Sunday, June 4th, which is actual Pentecost. And so, yeah, it's been a little tough, but this is what God began to show me this week. He began to show me that this is things are getting to be tough, and and maybe they've been tough for you already in May. If not, it's been tough this week alone, and it may get a little tougher here the next seven days. But what God is saying right now is, I want you to surrender all because June, when it comes, is your breakthrough time. Can I get an amen? Amen. So what does surrendering all mean? Well, you know, Doug, he stole my sermon. Um, Because Doug was telling us in the offering message about the fact that we can't have anything between us and God. God will not allow it. Idols are not allowed. And we can make idols out of everything. You can make an idol out of what you eat and drink. You can make an idol out of good things, bad things, people, finances, cars, houses. You just name it. We can make an idol out of anything. God wants nothing between us and him. And so if things have been getting tough for you, it's because there's been some things that you've been hanging on to that he doesn't want you to hang on to. And he's been making you aware of letting them go because the tough times were here and you didn't necessarily want to let some of those things go. Come on, I see some people shaking their heads. So even in my own life, God began to deal with me on Sunday and when The offering time came around. I came to the altar. God prompted me to come to the altar and give everything I had, the last bit that I had in my wallet. I didn't have no cash, by the way. All I had was a gift card. That is it. I said, God, I I don't have anything. I have zero in my wallet. He says, no, you don't. You got a gift card. And I was like, my God, I do. Laid on altar. So I laid it on the altar. It was very powerful for me to lay that on the altar because I knew God had called me to do it. At the moment that that happened, I felt something break in the spiritual realm for me personally. And I began to weep. And then Monday came around 
And God began to speak to me again. And I believe that what happened on Sunday opened up a door for greater revelation for me to understand on Monday what God was doing. And then this is how it ties in to the church overall. So then God began to say to me, I want you to bring me something else. I'm like, oh God, what? What else do you want? He says, I want another offering. And I said, Lord, Lord, don't you know that Pastor on my sowed a huge offering in April? And you want to ask us to do this again? Well, sure enough, Lord's talking to Pastor Adam. And Pastor Adam's telling me, yep, we're going to sow another large offering into the church. He says, don't you know, Candace, it's Acts 4 time. We're not in Acts 2 anymore. We're in Acts 4. And if God is asking for this, then we need to do what we need to do as a couple. And I said, my God, that's right. That's right. And then I read Acts chapter 4 again. Because if you remember, we, I preached on Acts chapter 4, and he, I believe he did too. When? In April. In April, we preached on Acts chapter 4 and how we were going to greater power. And we were going to greater anointing. And we were going from addition to multiplication. And then in order for there to be breakthrough, there had to be a place where we gave it all to God. Well, and this was part of my argument with God because I said, well, God, I did that in April. And he said, yeah, but don't you know it's getting ready to come up? And I'm like, what? He goes, Pentecost. He says, Acts chapter 2 turns to Acts chapter 4. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. He's like, pay attention. If I'm asking you to do something, I'm asking you to do it for a reason. He's like, this isn't a setback. This is a setup. Now get yourself ready for the setup. Get yourself ready for the breakthrough that you've been asking me for. Now, you broke through a lot in April. Huge in April. But I want to see you and your husband and your family and this church break through to another level in June that you couldn't even go to in May. I said, God, I'm ready to go. My whole attitude changed. Everything changed on the inside of me. Why? Because I heard from God. See, it's different. You, I can tell you what God's telling me, but God's got to tell you what God's telling you. And then it's got to register with you in such a way that you say yes and amen. And you respond in accordance with the way God wants you to respond. So God was just dealing with me and dealing with Pastor Adam. Now let me read Acts chapter 4. Because when we celebrate Shavuot and Pentecost coming up here, church we're going to celebrate is an Acts 4 church. No more Acts 2 in this house. Acts 4 is what we're going to do. So what does Acts chapter 4 say? And after they prayed, this is Acts chapter 4 verses 31 through 36. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no need, so power, powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For, for that's right, Amen. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, what they were doing is they were saying, listen, we are a community together. We're in this together, and we're going to do what it is that God is asking us to do. We're going to go to this greater place. Because the word said that with great power, the apostles continued to testify. In Acts chapter 2, it was power, but it wasn't the greater power. See, there's different levels that a church goes to, but there's also different requirements to get to the places that God's asking us to go. Listen, this house was not built apart from the people that are occupying those seats. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone has given. Everyone has blessed. Everyone has done their part. And in doing your part, we have this house for the Lord. But just because we've done our part then, because God was teaching us the things then, doesn't mean we don't do our part now, because God is teaching us things now. Listen, we're always learning and growing. Every, every second we are learning and growing, including Pastor Adam and I. Listen, you want us to learn and grow. You want God to knock on our heads. You want him to do these kinds of things because if he doesn't, then the rest of the church doesn't go to the places that y'all are supposed to go. So we're happy when God gives us a little smack on the head and says, wake up. In Acts chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, the word says, And all the more believers in the Lord, there were multitudes of men and women, and they constantly were added to their number, to such an extent that they carried the sick out into the streets, and they laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Hallelujah is right. Do you know the kind of people that come in here on Sunday? There's all different kinds. Well, I'm telling you, lots of times unclean spirits are identified and no longer in existence after they've been in our worship and our word. God is good in this place. He heals people in this place. He brings deliverance in this place. We have intercessors that pray consistently in this place. And in doing so, God positions us for miracles. But all of that comes at the cost. To obey God, there is always a sacrifice. Even in the Old Testament times, anytime they came to the Lord, they came and brought him sacrifices and offerings. And God was happy and pleased to receive them. Why? Because they represented the hearts of the people. So, so you must ask yourself a question today, just as I had to ask myself a question. Is there anything between you and God? Is there anything that you have not surrendered to the Lord? Because if there is and he brings it to your mind, this is the week to let that thing go. If he's calling you to let it go, lay it down. Good or bad, it's time to get rid of it. It's time to confess it. It's time to say you're not going to play with it anymore, whether it be good or bad. You're not going to play with it anymore, and you're going to put God first in that area. He's always calling us to put him first because he knows we're an adulterous people. We're an idolatrous, adulterous people that is always looking for something else other than God. And most of the time, it's things that we think are good and are okay, but that's the very thing that he wants us to let go of. Now, I don't know your mail. I haven't read your mail. I don't know what your thing is. I know what my thing was, and he dealt with me. And if God's going to deal with me, I'm going to tell him it's time for him to deal with you. Sorry, you don't get off scot-free. I don't get to take it for you. Somebody got to suffer in this house. I will not suffer alone. You will suffer with me. Hallelujah. That's called sharing it all, right? I suffer, you suffer. We all suffer together, right? I rejoice, you rejoice. We all rejoice together. Hallelujah. Okay, so this brings me to 1 Kings chapter 17. Why? Because if you're going to sacrifice and obey God, then let's do it in the glory of the Lord. Because what's in the glory of God will multiply at a very rapid rate. The last song that we sang uh, tonight there was, you had to have felt it. There was a shift of glory in the house, was there not? There was a shift, right? Okay, when the glory of the Lord comes into the house, that's the time to present your offerings to the Lord, to bring before God what needs to be brought to him, okay? Whatever that is, that's between you and him, okay? If, if you feel the glory come into this house, and believe me, for those that know when the glory's here, we'll call it out for you if you can't figure it out yourself. You come up to the altar. You give God an offering, okay? Whether it's an offering of your heart, whether it's an offering of laying something down. Listen, last October, I had an issue in my family that was a heartbreaking issue. I came to the Lord, and I lay, one night in worship, I said, God, I cannot carry this burden. I'm going to put this thing on the altar, and I'm not picking it back up, okay? I put it on the altar I didn't pick it back up. I left it in prayer, and now God has redeemed it. Eight months later, 
But I had to lay it. I literally had to physically come up here and drop that thing. What was I dropping? I was dropping the burden, and I said, I'm not picking it up. And then God turned the whole thing around, and he redeemed. Now, this Sunday, I dropped my gift card because that's all I had. But what happened is it broke open something. If nothing else, watch Pastor Adam and I if you want to know how to lay it down on the altar because we're really good at that. We've been doing that for years, laying it down on the altar. You lay it down on the altar, and God then will do what he needs to do. Melissa laid Lewis on the altar, and she got him back. Uh huh. That's right. So, so we learn to do these things, and then God blesses. Don't pick it back up after you lay it down either. Whatever it is, just don't do it. So, in First Kings chapter seventeen, let me talk to you about the widow Azarapeth. Now, what happened was Elijah had come to this brook, and he was on a journey, right? And he was following God. The prophet was going everywhere that that God was telling him to go, and he came to this brook, and it dried up, and then God said, listen, Elijah, I got a place for you to go. I want you to go to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, and I directed a widow there to supply you with some food. Now, this is the prophet of the Lord, and he had the glory of the Lord upon him, okay? And how do we know that? Because great miracles happened when he was around. Now, when he went to Zarephath, he came to the town gate, and a widow was there, and she was gathering sticks. And he called her and said, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called and said, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. So he's in the town, and he's asking for bread, and he's asking for water. And then the word says, as surely as the Lord lives, she replied, Listen, man, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. Like, that's all I have. You, man of God, have come here to ask me for something, but I'm telling you, this is all I have. Just a little flour and just a little oil. But it, it's all she has. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. She was already prepared. I can hear her now every day murmuring, complaining, saying, God, I'm going to die. Lord, what are you going to do? I only got a little flour. I only got a little oil. Somebody help me in this place. And God sends the prophet to her house. And what does he ask her for? The very thing that she says is the only thing she has to keep her and her son alive. The only problem is it was only good for one cake. That was only going to last for a day, and then she was going to be on a big 40-day fast after that. So when the prophet shows up and asks her for the little flour and the little oil, she's looking at her life's blood right there. This is for me and my son. This is it. I was going to go make my one cake, and then that was going to be it. But now you're asking me you're giving me an opportunity? Like, I just saw this cake that I was going to make and I was going to die, but you're asking me for the very thing that I don't want to let go of because that's the thing that might keep me alive just for a little while longer before I die. But you're giving me an invitation that if I will obey and sacrifice what I have, that I could step into a place of multiplication. Come on, can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, so when we get to that place of saying, oh, my gosh, I can't take it anymore. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. Oh, my gosh, this isn't going to work. My God, what are we going to do? It's then that God will show up on your doorstep and he'll say, give me the last bit that you have. That's when you're going, no, God, don't ask me for that thing. Don't, do not ask me for that thing because that thing, that thing is all I have. But that thing that that is all you've got is the very faith component that is your invitation for deliverance. Your invitation to step into that place of multiplication. So she goes, and what does she do? She says, well, he tells her, look, don't be afraid. Because, listen, that's the first thing that enters our mind is we're afraid. No, God, please, I can't let you have that. He says, go home and do as you've said. Make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. 
he's even really nice because he's telling her what's going to happen if she'll live by faith. Listen, that's nice. When God was talking to me on Monday, right, and he was telling me what I was supposed to be doing, right, he said, listen, he was good to me. He was good. He said, this is an invitation. He's like, I need you to look up and not look down. I need you to give me all of it and look up and don't look down. And he says, if you'll do that, you're going to step into this breakthrough. And I'm like, okay, I'm not sure what breakthrough looks like, but um, I know what I have in my heart and what I'm hoping for. So my husband wants to do this. We need to do this. Let's do this. So he told her specifically, right? She got the specific. I just got the arbitrary breakthroughs coming. I need you to do this. Okay, I'm not sure what that looks like exactly. She found out that she's going to have a jar of oil and flour that was never going to stop. All right? So she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. It didn't stop. It went into multiplication. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Now, she believed and she did. I believed and we are. He believed and we are. And when we do this, we're in expectation of what God's going to do because he's not going to ask us to give him something unless he plans on multiplying what we give him in a huge way. Can I get an amen? Because we need you to stand with us in faith. Come on. I need somebody's faith in this room. Does somebody have some faith in this room? Is there anybody with faith in this room? Come on. Somebody's got to have some faith. Hallelujah. So we're going to step out in faith, and we're going to believe God, and then we need your all's faith to attach to our faith, and then you'll be obedient to do what God's calling you to do. Now, the same thing happened to the boy with the five loaves of bread and the two small fish. This is where Doug attempted to steal my story. So there's this boy, and he has five small loaves and two fish, right? And, and John chapter 6 verse 9 says, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? You see, Jesus wanted to minister to the people, but he knew they were hungry. And so the apostles found this little boy, and that's all he had. And the little boy brought it to Jesus, and Jesus multiplied it. Now, where am I going with this? When we bring it to God, God touches it, and then it just multiplies. See, they just believed, and it just happened. But, you know, it was an invitation. When they asked the little boy, can you give me the five loaves of bread and there's and this two small fish, the little boy happily gave it up. But what did he do? He gave it up. Can I hear that? He gave it up. He gave it up. He didn't give it down. He gave it up. And see, that's what God was sharing with me. He says, I know you get in these kinds of situations and stuff happens and whenever there's tests and trials, everybody always looks down. But I need them to look up because if they look up and they sow upward, that's when the change is going to be made. But so many people are so concerned about sowing downward. And when God was dealing with me, he says, you're not going backwards by sowing. You're going upwards. When you sow, you sow up. And I said, oh my God, you're right. And he said, listen, just like the boy with the fish and just like Elijah and, and the widow of Zarephath, they're sowing up, up, up. And so that's where the change is made. When you sow up into the glory is when breakthrough happens. And so we have to remember this. When God brings an invitation, we respond to an invitation. Now, Shavuot and Pentecost, the Jews always bring an offering to the Lord. They bring an offering. And so when God reminded me, I'm asking you for the right time and the right season. Now, we don't usually do that here at Freedom Destiny because we do first fruits and we do Resurrection Sunday. We do the Passover and we do Day of Atonement. But the fact of the matter is, God didn't care about whatever schedule we set up in line with that. He said, I want you and Adam to do this for me on this date and time and then watch me do what I need to do. And, you know, I got excited and I couldn't just get excited for myself. I had to get excited for you all. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Because see, if God's going to tell me to do that, I'm sure that he's got a blessing waiting for you too. But the point was, God said, listen, there's stuff between the people and me. And I don't like that. I don't like that. Because what I want to bring forth means there can't be anything between me and my people. And my people are always putting this stuff 
And the very thing that I asked you to let go of is because it was creating something between you and me or something between Adam and me, and I don't want that, and between the church and me, and I don't want that, God said, because I want you to go up, and I want the whole church to go up. And so we listen, and we obey, but the obedience is with what? A sacrifice. So tonight, as we come forth, I'm going to ask the band to come on up. We're going to have a time where we take a look at our hearts, and I'm going to invite you to come up to the altar. When the music starts, I'm going to invite you to come up to Or you can come up to the altar now. The music doesn't have to be on. But I want you to come up, and I just want you to pray. And I want you to pray and ask the Lord, because I believe an activation is going to take place. I believe that an activation is going to take place in your heart where God is going to share with you, if he hasn't already even today, what it is that is between you and him. Because as we go into this season, which is getting ready to start another season, okay, because of Pentecost and Shavuot, we want to go with freedom. We want to go with nothing between us and God. We want to go with that place of going upward, the place to multiplication. We don't want to be an Acts chapter 2 church. We want to be an Acts chapter 4 church. But with Acts chapter 4 means that there's greater responsibility, and so greater responsibility means that each one of us have to look at who we are and what is God speaking to us. Now, if this is your first time in this place and you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus is the one that died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and then resurrected that you might be set free. He's the one that gives you forgiveness every day of your life. If you need forgiveness in your heart, for anything that's taken place, Jesus is the one that takes care of that forgiveness. And how did he? He did it when he sacrificed himself. He gave himself as an offering to the Lord that we might be set free. So if you're in the house tonight and that's you and you don't know Jesus like that, you don't know him as the one that can remove your sin and your burdens, your weaknesses, your infirmities, these things from your life, then this is an invitation to know him. All you have to do is confess that you need him. I need you, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Heal me of my iniquities. Help me, Lord. And then he comes into your heart, and instantly you're forgiven. Then you got to live it out. you got to live this forgiveness out in your life. And we want to come to know who you are. So all you got to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And then tell us about that. And we've got some people that will be in the back of the next steps table or there will be some people up here and you can let us know if that's you. We want to bless you with the Bible. We want to help you get through what you need to get through. But tonight, we're going to seek God for what's between us and Him. We're going to surrender everything in this place. God, we thank you right now, Lord. We thank you that your presence is calling us to surrender, God. We thank you that each one of us want more of you, God. And we don't want anything between us and you, God. Anything good or anything bad, God. We just want you, Lord. And so, God, we want to praise you. We want to thank you that because of your son, Jesus Christ, you made a way that we can know you like that. Listen, wives, you need to lay your husbands at the altar. Husbands, you need to lay your wives at the altar. Parents, you need to lay your kids at the altar. You need to lay your jobs at the altar. You need to lay your finances at the altar. You need to lay your houses at the altar, your rent payments, your mortgage payments at the altar. You got to lay your cars at the altar, your car payments, all that mess. You got to lay your electric bill and your Comcast bill, all those things that you got that you worry about night and day, who's gonna take care of those? I know a God that will take care of those, but it can't be between you and Him. See, He comes first. We're gonna lay down the good things, and we're gonna lay down the bad things. We're gonna lay down our addictions. We're gonna lay down our lies. We're gonna lay down our manipulations. We're gonna lay down our control. We're gonna lay down our fears. We're gonna lay down our worries. We're gonna lay down the people that aggravate us, the people that drive us crazy. 
We're going to lay down the people that we love more than life itself. And how would we live and exist if they weren't a part of our lives? We're going to lay down everything as an offering before God. Because he wants it all. He wants nothing between us and him. And as you lay on the altar, there is nothing between you and him. Except for what you're not willing to give up. And as he pulls on your heart and he tugs on your heart right now through this faith activation, it's then determined that you need to bring the sacrifice. Be obedient and bring the sacrifice, whatever it is, whatever it is. Because when you hand it over to him, it'll break off of your life and you'll go to that place of multiplication. We know that we're going into the new season and the season of Pentecost, the season where the Holy Spirit descended upon us and we spoke in other tongues. We received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We received power. And then we're asking for Acts chapter four, greater power. But these are the things that will stop us from getting to that place. So God, we praise you and we thank you in this house right now, God, that you want nothing between us and you. That you wanna take us to the place of that greater power, that multiplication and not addition God and we want to thank you Lord that you have called our hearts to give you all of us every ounce of us everything God that nothing should separate us from the Lord nothing father we thank you in this place God that as we lift up to you in song in praise and adoration God that you are doing something in our hearts right now even tonight, some of you are going to have dreams and visions. You're going to see things in the spiritual realm where God's going to speak to you about the things that are stopping your flow to the next level, that are preventing you from getting to that increased phase, that place that you're praying for, and you didn't even know that thing was holding you back. You didn't even know that glory was right there and you had the opportunity. And he's going to show that to you. He's going to give you that revelation. I thank you for the revelation of glory, the knowledge of glory, God, the knowledge to go to the next places in you, God, the virtue and the valor that we need to go to those places. Be strong in the Lord. Be courageous and lay it down. God, I thank you. You're going to give this people courage, God, courage just to put it down, whatever needs to go down, that we may rise up to the occasion, that we may go to the places that you've called us to go, that with everything we give you, we're sowing up into this. We praise you, Father, and we thank you. And together, we're going to begin to worship you. Just continue to worship him. Father, we praise you in this place. Let's just worship him.